As we're talking, I can hear the Israeli fighter jets overhead. I don't know that if you can. We're also sometimes seeing flashes of bombs and missiles landing in Gaza, which is less than a kilometer away. A few minutes ago, there was some incoming rocket fire. That shows that Hamas is still in the business of firing rockets into Israel. They were shot down by Israeli air defense. As you said, there is this great danger now of law and order breaking down within Gaza. The UN is very worried about it. Israel says that what it is doing is it's going to destroy Hamas, both militarily as a, and also as a governing force. But if it succeeds in doing that, then what do you have? You have anarchy. You have gangs taking over. You have organized crime. We know from what happened when the dictatorships in Libya and Iraq fell what that is like. But that does not seem to be deterring the Israelis. <laughs> The wrath of Israel is concentrated on Gaza City and elsewhere in the north. This is what was happening while the Strip was under a mobile and internet blackout. No means to call an ambulance, so they use whatever vehicle they can find, knowing the next missile or airstrike won't be far off. The Palestinian Red Crescent sent video of people sheltering in Al-Quds Hospital in Gaza City which they say the Israeli Defense Forces have told them to evacuate. Later, they sent footage from the hospital just after a strike nearby. Some of those who fled south are living in tents in Khan Yunus, hoping the Israelis won't bomb what is obviously a camp. Sanitary conditions are terrible. Food and water are in short supply and there's no fuel. Israel says it will allow more aid to cross into Gaza now, but it's created a humanitarian disaster by forcing so many people south into a cramped area with few resources. No wonder young men and children looted several UN warehouses. But such a breakdown in law and order is a warning of what could happen if Israel succeeds in destroying Hamas, the only authority in Gaza anarchy would be a further catastrophe. An Israeli soldier took a video showing his platoon raising the Israeli flag, as he put it, in the heart of Gaza. The IDF sent in more forces overnight, releasing footage of tanks and, for the first time, foot soldiers, reportedly inside an open area in northern Gaza. Last night, the Prime Minister said the war against Hamas would be long and difficult. They showed armoured bulldozers operating on the Gaza side of the Erez crossing, where they say they found Hamas fighters trying to exit a tunnel. Hamas, for its part, released a video which appears to show a wire-guided missile strike on an Israeli armoured vehicle, one in a column that had entered Gaza, a sign that this battle will not be cost-free for either side. Early this morning, an Israeli airstrike hit the Bilal bin Rabah mosque in central Gaza. How much more before Israel decides that's enough? Lindsay Hilson reporting there. Well, we cannot get into Gaza ourselves, but filmmaker Yusuf Hamash, who also works for the Norwegian Refugee Council, has been sending us moving reports about the situation there. I spoke to him earlier about the last two days since Israel stepped up its ground and air offensive on the besieged strip. Listen. 
So we found ourselves disconnected for more than past six hours without any warning even before that. And we, we just been isolated from the rest of the world. And it's not that even. We were also isolated from ourselves, between ourselves here. We couldn't check for our families or relatives all across Gaza. So we literally, we didn't know what's going on in the next street because we didn't have also radio station or internet or even phone calls. We were just building assumptions that maybe they saw the ground invasion, they, the connection came back today. And yeah, and we were relieved because we at least we get back to life. We back to understand what's going on around us. Because that kind of darkness, I mean, literal darkness, because the lights have been turned off, and information darkness, that must be terrifying under the circumstances. Honestly, Matt, it was a terrifying situation because we literally didn't know anything. And we, we had to invent a few mechanisms to move around in Gaza. We have to inform where we're going, what time we're going to come back. And even I was understanding that also regarding the ambulances and the rescue teams, they couldn't know where the targeting was, the bombing. People had to approach hospitals to grab ambulances and getting back to collect injuries. And we saw these images of you driving through uh, Gaza, and it, the destruction was more like the kind of destruction you see after an earthquake. It was more than an earthquake. Even me, I was completely surprised. I wasn't expecting that I would see that. We, they turn these... We used to see Gaza block of concrete, and they turn it into rubble. Suddenly, it was they turn it into ash. And I've been living in these streets for 30 years now, 31 years. I did organize it, man. And Yusuf, we've also seen these pictures of the UNRWA warehouses getting looted by desperate Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. Tell us about the situation of law and order. Is that now breaking down? Because that's what some of the reports are suggesting might be happening. So unfortunately, there is a gap and needs in Gaza. There is no enough for anyone. And because of this, they tightened this, the, the sea since the first day of this war. So we couldn't, there is literally no, no access for all basic needs. So people who are desperate, throwing the streets, homeless, doesn't have any access for anything. Unfortunately, it's really sad to see that. But that's, that's what happened. Because now people are thinking about how to provide mm. water and bread. And every day it became even for do these two essential items. It became really hard. So it's expected to see more of these scenes if the situation gets mm. longer. Because also on the ground, there is no enough. I don't think there's enough security on the ground to control the situation here. Last time I spoke to you, Yusuf, about a week ago, I think you were down to one bottle of water, half litre bottle of water per person per day. Has that situation got any better at all? Unfortunately, it's getting worse. Now, even I was, recently, two days ago, I was trying to find water, and we couldn't find a way to push the water onto the house tanks. And I needed one liter of fuel. And to find this one liter of fuel, it takes me five hours rolling around in Khan Yunus. And when I found a friend of mine car, I had to take it to the mechanic to pull out one liter of fuel. Five hours just to manage to find water for the house. It's, it's a cycle of layers that are connected to each other. And to fulfill one, you need the other, and then you need the other. Now, I know that you're in Khan Yunus in the south of the Gaza Strip, but the Gaza Strip is a, a small territory. Is there any evidence of the Israeli land invasion where you are? What I understood that they did in the north and western part of Gaza and also in the eastern part of Jabali City, they, they already do that, did that. But, and, and we hear in the night this massive clash that's taking place in the eastern part and the northern part of Gaza. Because, as you mentioned, Gaza is narrow piece land, so you can hear what's going on in the north. If the bombardment is in the north, we hear in the south and Hanumis, we hear it clearly. And is there any evidence of Hamas on the streets? What are they saying to people? What are people saying to them? I, I don't think there is any evidence for any Hamas on the streets because you know the risk that they, should, they could take. We have surveillance by drones 24 hours. Finally, Yusuf, how's your family doing? I wish, Matt, I could say this is... This is horror movie for every day. All of us are traumatized. Imagine how is our children I mean, and how is our feeling as fathers when we are useless in front of our children because we cannot protect them, cannot mm. provide them safety. And I think we need years to recover from what we are seeing now. Yusuf Hamish, thank you very much indeed and I wish you and your family all the best. Thank you, man. Thank you. Well, joining me now is Leo Kanz, Kanz rather, who's Médecin Sans Frontières, head of mission here in Palestine. Thank you very much for coming to join us. You've got, I think, 28 tonnes of supplies waiting to go into the Gaza Strip. That's is that correct. your first shipment? 
Yeah, that's correct. It's uh, currently in Egypt, but we have also uh, stock in, uh, in Israel. So we have stock everywhere and we are ready to come in. So that could make a real difference to people on the ground? Yeah, that starts to make a big difference. But I want to say that until now, the supply is really, really not enough. So we are really uh, waiting for this opening of borders. And will you be able to make sure that when the supplies get in, they get to the right places and to the hospitals where they're needed most? Yes, of course. You know, we have a team of 228 people on the ground, so we can make sure that uh, the supply coming to the hospital we are already working with. 228? Yeah. That's correct. That's a lot of people. Yeah, that's correct. Are they okay? Are they all safe? Until now, they are all okay. Many of them lost family members, unfortunately, and many of them lost their houses as well. Um, plus, uh, a big part of them has been displaced uh, in the south, and mm. uh, we have a few of them sleeping outside without any roof. So it's a very difficult life actually for them now. And are some of them working in the hospitals in the north, which are either under evacuation orders or in danger of getting bombed by the, by the Israelis? Yes, exactly. You know, the, the, the life in Gaza is very difficult for the whole population. We are in contact with our staff every day almost every hour, especially the people in the hospitals, and they are undergoing a very, very hard time. Basically, uh, their, their, their day is they are taking care of patients. It's a continuous influx of patients. Yeah. Uh, they see many children, many women. Um, last time we had an operation, I was discussing with a surgeon. He was operating a 10 years old boy on the floor of the hospital because all the OT mm. were full in front of the mother, in front of the sister, and they were amputating his foot without the correct dose of, of uh, morphine. Horrific. So it's, it's horrific. This is pure horror. When, uh, when the doctors tell us about what's going on in the hospital, they, they, they use themselves the word hell, the word nightmare. They don't have any much worse to, to, to do this. It's, it's terrible. And even for us, we see the video, we see the pictures, we, see, we talk with them. It's, a, it's, a, we, it's very, very difficult even for us to see this, this horrific pictures, horrific video. Especially for the children, it's, uh, it's terrible. I mean, MSF goes to all sorts of dangerous and difficult places, natural disasters and war zones. What does this compare to? This is, I think, for me personally, it's been uh, 13 years I'm working with MSF, it's the worst I've ever seen. Of anywhere? Uh, of anywhere, because people are trapped. People have nowhere to go. People are with their children, their wives, they have nowhere to go. They, sleep in the, they, they tell us they sleep in the same room because they want to either live together or die together. Mm. And they tell us how terrifying is the bombing and how the children are screaming every night, how they are doing a nightmare. Mm. It's, it's horrible. It's, uh, it's, it's really terrific. And the idea of evacuating hospitals, I mean, the Al-Quds Hospital has 14,000 people basically taking shelter yeah. there and 400 patients in ICU. Yes. That's a death sentence. That, that's a death said. sentence. This is, there is no other, other word. We are asking the, the, the health taker to choose between the life of their patient and their own life. They say, if you want to, to protect your own life, go to the south, which, by the way, the south is heavily bombed. So there is nowhere safe. And they, we are asking them to, to abandon the patients. There is no way to evacuate the hospital. It's impossible logistically, and it's inhuman. It's inhuman order. We cannot ask the, 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 health, mm. the caretaker sure. to abandon the patients. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, really, uh, it's really a big dilemma for, for, for our staff. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very terrible okay. and I, I cannot stress enough that the situation is catastrophic mm. and it needs to move. We need to move now. We are ready. We have supply. We have people ready to come in. I hear you and thank you very much for your work. Leo Kons, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Well, at a rare press conference this time yesterday, Israel's Prime Minister sought to put on a show of unity, appearing alongside his Defence Minister and Opposition Leader, Benny Gantz, part of the War Cabinet. Benjamin Netanyahu declared that the offensive in Gaza is Israel's second war of independence. But hours later, he sparked a furious backlash across the political spectrum with an ill-judged tweet from his office blaming others for the Hamas attacks. Inside the inscrutable fortress of Israel's defense ministry in Tel Aviv, a row has been brewing between the prime minister and his intelligence chiefs over who knew what when about the Hamas attacks. His office tweeted that he hadn't been warned, but then took down the tweet. So what does an embattled Mr. Netanyahu, here in an awkward meeting with hostage families, do to rally the nation? Reach for the Old Testament. We will fight and we will win, he said. It'll be the victory of good over evil. But he also referred to the Amalek from the Old Testament, whom the Israelites destroyed utterly, man, woman and child. But talk of a civilizational battle just enhances the trauma of Black Saturday. We witnessed the cleanup in Rishon Lezion, a working class town with a large Ethiopian Jewish population. The damage here had been caused by a Hamas missile slamming into number six. Most of them are shot down by the Iron Dome defense shield, 
the very few that get through rarely result in fatalities. And no, this doesn't look anything like the destruction in Gaza, but everything in Israel is now seen through the dark prism of October the 7th. Ido, the neighbor at number five, is moving his parents to a safer location. Uh, this is the reality in Israel. Have you had attacks here before? Uh, no, no, not like this. Is, uh, you can see all the houses uh, don't have a safe uh, security here. So there's no shelter? Here. No shelter, no nothing. The, when you have a rocket in the air, they go to the, the stairs and, so that's what and you did. pray to God. The municipal park should be packed at lunchtime, but it belongs to the pigeons and to Matan, an IT entrepreneur who's now a reservist in the National Guard. We worked very hard on creating a vibrant country where we can be uh, peaceful and, and be with each other and come together and be united. And all that's ground to a halt? Very much so, yes. Uh, the situation right now is uh, that everything is uh, stuck. What's stuck. happened to your business then? My business has been uh, down by 90% right by 90%. now. 90%? 90%, yeah. Hey! The sound that Israel has chosen to ignore for years, but is all too familiar in the West Bank. The funeral of another Palestinian killed by the IDF during the house demolition of a suspected terrorist. What should have been part of a viable Palestinian state is a powder keg waiting to erupt, and the destruction of Gaza makes that all the more likely. Back to the astonishing alternative reality on the beach in Tel Aviv, while Gaza is being bombed on the same coastline less than an hour's drive away. Israel learned to thrive with the Palestinians largely out of sight and out of mind. That has now ended, but old habits die hard. Now, here in the UK, Labour says it won't sack shadow cabinet members who rebel against the party's position on the Israel-Hamas conflict. Leader Sakir Starmer has refused to call for a ceasefire, arguing instead for a brief humanitarian pause to allow in aid. Senior party figures, including London Mayor Sadiq Khan, Manchester Mayor Andy Burnham and Labour's leader in Scotland, Anna Sawa, have all broken ranks with Sakir Starmer and called for a ceasefire. Labour frontbencher Peter Kyle has been speaking to our reporter, Kami Nzera. What we've done is look at the needs of people who are suffering in Gaza right now, today. There are people who are starving for lack of food. They need water. There are people dying because of the lack of simple, basic medical provisions. Are they not dying because of the bombs? Uh, so what we need to do is do what's practical and what can be done now to make a difference in people's lives. That is a pause for humanitarian purposes. How many Palestinian children would need to die for the Labour Party to change its view and call for a ceasefire? You're talking to someone here who's a former aid worker. I understand the impact that war has on individual people. It is horrific. We want this to stop straight away. The fastest way for this war to end would be for Hamas to release the hostages, two of which are British citizens. Are senior Labour Party figures now officially allowed to call for a ceasefire? There are people with lived experiences uh, of these issues within the Labour Party. That's the strength of our party. Keir has been listening to all of those perspectives. To the outside, it looks a bit weak rather than their strength no, because you're not speaking from the same hymn sheet. Diversity is a strength, and we are probably the most diverse uh, political party in Europe. We have people with lived experiences uh, and connections to both sides of this conflict that's unfolding in the Middle East, mm. and we have been able to listen, to learn, and come up with a set of policies which are in step with our international partners and would have a meaningful impact on the ground today. Mr. Carl, thank you. Thank you.